Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the She's Making an Impact podcast. I'm your host, Rachel and Gome. Today, we're going to be diving in to how to lead a remote team effectively. So I've brought on Drew Moffitt. He leads marketing at Kumo Space. Um, he's one of the company's earliest employees, helped take it from pre-funded with 100 users, being used by several million around the world. Um, so he's been in the startup space for a while. So we talk about the startup space, um, leading you know, company culture virtually all that good stuff. So I hope you enjoy our conversation. Let's dive in. Hey, Drew, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, let's dive in. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. I'm a marketer at Kumo Space. Um, we're building virtual office software. This basically replicates all the benefits of a physical office in a virtual space. Uh, and then before that, I was a founder and operator. So this is kind of like the seventh time that I have uh, been around the startup, uh, you know, helping found a company in some yeah. capacity or another. Yeah. So how did you like start in that world? What did that look like? Yeah. So I was probably a little bit naive, uh, <laughs> like we all are at a young yep. age. Um, I went to college uh, in 2007. I graduated in 2011. So that kind of starting year was a whole different uh, world than the ending year. Um, I naively kind of just believed that I would end up in finance and, you know, that seemed kind of like the natural path in the mid two thousands. Um, obviously the 2008 financial crisis came about and that pretty, pretty quickly became not the reality. I'd also gone to like a small liberal arts college. I had enjoyed my time in college. Um, and, uh, you know, like Goldman Sachs was not coming knocking uh, on doing on campus recruiting, much less looking for me uh, in 2011. So I ended up going uh, into residential real estate, um, doing very high end sales, typically kind of in the, the price point of about like $20 million. Um, that was not me. Uh, I was just on a team with a woman who, uh, who was doing that, uh, supporting her. And I did that for a little over a year, maybe a year and a half. And um, I decided, you know, it taught me some interesting, like good skills, but I wanted to be more challenged. And I ended up finagling my way into some classes at Columbia Business School. And then that uh, led me to start a company called Forever Not. And fast forward 10 years later, I'm still in the startup ecosystem. Yeah. So tell us what you're doing now and what that looks like. Yeah, so I joined Kumo Space. Uh, you know, the, the product is, I think, about 45 days older than my tenure at the company. So I have been here for a lot of the journey, um, one of the earliest employees. Uh, when I joined the company, it uh, was really just kind of self funded by the two founders. And pretty shortly after that, there was a seed round and then ultimately a Series A. Uh, and my time here has just been kind of two main things. One, figuring out like kind of what the little bit of lightning in the bottle that we felt we had back in the you know late summer of 2020, uh, you know, what that is, how to market that is that to people, you know, who that ICP is, um, and then really just focusing on getting that word out there. And obviously the last two, three years have been kind of a very shifting period of time. So yeah our use of the products has really changed the way that people use it. Initially, it was just like a better version of Zoom for group interactions. So like this call one-on-one, -on -one, really great for kind of having like a Zoom or Zoom type product. But uh, if we're trying to have like a virtual happy hour, uh, Zoom is not particularly good. Like one person speaks and everyone kind of listens and most of those people disengage. And that's where Kumo Space really excelled. Uh, and that's where people started using it heavily in 2021. And we really refer to that as like the virtual events use case. So everything from a, a conference or as I mentioned, a happy hour, we had weddings, et cetera, kind of happening in our product. Uh, but as the world went back to physically doing those events in person, um, we realized it was like a subset of users who were trying to use this product to manage and run uh, a virtual or kind of remote team as this always on virtual office for them. And just like, you know, Zoom, you can record and one person can screen share and your chat isn't persistent. Like that's good for these kind of quick interactions. Um, 
you know, a scheduled call. But when you're trying to live here in here all day long, um, you need to be able to have multiple people screen sharing. You need to have like the, the notes that you wrote on a previous conversation be able to be discoverable in chat. So it was just a lot of functionality that we hadn't anticipated needing that these users were basically just uh, doing without because they were enjoying the camaraderie, kind of the, the, the better culture, better collaboration, kind of better team visibility they're getting from it. So much of 2022 focused on just like supporting and building the features that make those users happy. Cool. So you worked on different continents leading teams. Can you share like what are some of the the top do's and don'ts when it comes to managing a team virtually? Yeah. So I think like just stepping back, like managing people in general is always like a challenging activity. I think going back to my time working in real estate, my then boss um, was a woman who is often compared to like the Meryl Streak uh, character from Devil Wears Prada, but of like New York City real estate. Um, so a, a bit of an intense personality to work for. And I think that showed me just a lot of the things that I didn't want to do as a manager. Hmm. And I think the things that I took away from that, I've tried to always like, per, you know, make sure that is the things that I do. So whether or not you're physical or virtual, I think those couple of items are, helping people pick deadlines, helping kind of remind them of those deadlines, but also trying to be supportive when they get blocked, really trying to be collaborative with them to try and get them back on track or adjust the deadline. That would be kind of one example. I think it it's often hard to, like you have to have a lot of hard conversations, just try to em uh, enter those conversations with a high degree of empathy. Um, and like the other parts of it is that like you should really approach the situation that the person that you're managing is trying to do their best, hmm. right? Even if you feel maybe the work product is not the best. Um, when you are doing that in a virtual environment, it becomes just a lot harder, um, especially if you're doing those kind of communications in a tool like Slack or Teams, the way you send a, a message because it is text-based lacks like my tone, my physical body language. And it's really easy to start getting those, uh, you know, those, the way that the person's receiving that um, in an unpleasant way. Like the, the joke right now is that like the younger generation doesn't like the thumbs up emoji and thinks that it can be like passively aggressive. And it's like, <laughs> you know, may, maybe we shouldn't be relying on managing virtual teams by like text-based, you know, chat. Hmm. What would you suggest instead? I mean, obviously I'm going to, you know, say give Kumo space a try, but the things that I like about it is that I just have a sense of like what's happening in the world around me that like I would in a physical uh, office. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, perfect example today is I was trying to remember and ensure that I remembered I had to have a, a, a difficult conversation with a vendor and I um, went to one of my team members who was on the call last week and I just, in Kumo space, I could just move my avatar over to where she was um, because I could she, see she was available and I could quickly just kind of start talking with her and talking through kind of that conversation and just being like, please kind of confirm that I remembered these things um, correctly. So the, the collaborative nature you really need to have, and that's why a lot of people are saying, oh, well, we have to go back to the physical office is because like, if I was in a physical office, that would have been the equivalent of stopping by her desk. Right. Um, so you just need that ability to do that. And it's a lot harder when, um, you know, it's very remote work is highly productive when you're in like kind of an async environment. Um, when you're doing something like writing a memo and sending it to someone and having them review it and sending that, hey, here, can you add comments or let me know your thoughts? But like actually doing that in more like a paired programming kind of reviewing way, like you need that to start happening in a synchronous way, like how we're having this conversation. Got it. What are some ways you found to build effective team culture virtually? <laughs> so I think the big the big thing that people just really need to accept is that like you cannot build team culture with this like random, even uh, monthly Zoom happy hour, right? Like we've all tried this. We've all walked away from this feeling like unhappy and like fatigued. So 
for us, what we've realized is, and we use our product, you know, every day is that the thing that builds team culture, especially in a remote environment is the ability to have those like brief water cooler moments, those abilities to have that interactions. So even though we don't have a physical office, we do have three um, offsites once a quarter, roughly, uh, that are done physically just to like get people together and kind of rem- like add the body to the rest of the head. Right. Uh, and the other thing is that like we encourage those collaborative instances, like just c- talking to this coworker, those conversations typically don't just start like a Slack message, like, hey, what did I say last week at this meeting? It's typically like, how's your morning? What's your coffee? Like, what type of coffee do you like? Those little micro interactions is really what starts building camaraderie and like relationships between people. And inside our product, like you're able to edit your space and make it start reflecting who you are. So if you're like very much into music, like one of our software engineers, his entire office is set up like a DJ space. And if you're maybe have young children and maybe you have photos of your children, these are kind of those physical things that you would have seen in a physical office that like help add context and understanding to your, uh, you know, your, the people that you're working with. Got it. Um, what are some ways we can create more engagement with a remote team? Yeah. So another thing that we do that we really uh, enjoy is nothing at Kuma Space is mandatory right? Like we really want to like stress that, I, you know, when you're thinking about culture, it really should be a pulling versus a pushing activity. Hmm. And we, so every week we have on Thursdays, um, there's uh, an hour block of time on everyone's calendar. It's kind of optional to show up or we'll all just like eat lunch. We give every team member a budget. They can go charge it on their Brex credit card um, to get some food delivered or like buy some groceries or whatever. Um, and those moments just kind of naturally organically happen, right? Like if my day happens to be really busy, I'll skip it because I had to like catch up on something. Or if someone's child is ill, like they can skip it because they're dealing with their child. Like they're, that, that flexibility mm-hmm. allows those kind of organic interactions to happen. So I'd say like that would be one. I think another one is clicking, picking a clear organizational strategy. And you see a lot of companies really, really failing with this right now, where they're like, we're working remote. Uh, Okay, now we're going to work in office five days a week or four days a week, whatever it might be hybrid. But most of the employees are not showing up. And then it kind of creates these like awkward, weird dynamics where the office is half filled and those like cultural elements aren't really happening. Um, You know, really emphasize not trying to force people, but also be really clear, like, hey, we want to invest in better culture. So like, we are going to make sure that everyone comes, if you're running a hybrid schedule, that we're going to come in on these two or three days of the week. And like, we're going to make a uh, company lunch on one of those days. If you're something like a remote first organization like us, you know, pick a time that, people can always get together. Another activity we do is every two weeks, um, we have game night. So after our end of the uh, Thursday all hands meeting, we have the opportunity to stick around and play, you know, various like board games kind of virtually with team members. Cool. So you've been in the startup space for quite some time. What are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? You know, the thing that I would say my advice to everyone doing this is always try to slim down the problem and figure out how you can get to a nascent understanding of what, uh, you know, nascent functioning of what you're trying to do. So a good example is when I first did Forever Not, it took me about nine months to get the app into the app store. Mm -hmm. It took about 30 days for the app to go viral and then ultimately be disallowed by Apple. Wow. Right. So my learning in that moment was how could I compress the time to getting that app to the app store? Hmm. And when I went at a second time uh, with a company called Tailbus, I went from idea to first revenue in like 60 days. Mm-hmm. 
So it was just a far faster pace. And I kind of dumbed down. I said, okay, great. It'd be nice if I had a booking website, but I also could just kind of throw together my own website and use like a third party booking tool, um, you know, that are out there that allow you to do ticketing for mm -hmm. events. And that's how you quickly think about, okay, here is my idea. Mm -hmm. Here's what a perfect, you know, future version, if it was Uber, but like, what is Uber with, you know, 200 bucks, Uber with 200 bucks is you make a landing page, you run some ads on Facebook, you tell people to text this phone number and you have a bunch of people sitting in a room and like calling dial seven, you know, black car services. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in like two weeks without having to like really write a line of code. And then you can validate if like people actually like that service. Hmm. And if they do, then invest in building like your first version of the Uber app. But it often what I see is a lot of founders like are so convinced that they're going to be the next Uber that they spend so much time building this app or this, you know, service or this piece of software. And then they get to market and they realize that like, there's no one here wanting not, not less just wanting the product. Like there's just, how do we even market it? And they kind of mm -hmm. oversight of, of, of that piece. So it's like so much nicer to know that like, maybe this idea is not viable way earlier on. Yeah. Okay. Um, what does it mean to you to make an impact? For me, I think, you know, it depends on like, how would you quantify that? Are you talking about like a business or like personal impact or? Oh, it's however you interpret it. I think for a business impact, um, sort of that's what our been, been our topic. Uh, for me, it's about like being able to just quantify what you did. And then this is another thing that is a big piece of culture is trying to like celebrate wins together. Mm -hmm. So in our uh, all hands meeting every week, we have the opportunity to shout out people who we thought like went in above and beyond and kind of like achieved that value. And it's just highlighting something that they maybe did that was a win. And often for me, it's like, if you make enough of those small impacts on the business, you'll move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. So for me, making an impact is seeing a problem and going and iterating and testing on that and trying to come up with a solution. I think even it, you can go so far as to say that like actually making an impact may even be failing in trying to find, find that solution because like that is the learning process. Yeah, We've spent so much time lately uh, on SEO related work. It's a topic I had some you know, decent understanding but I've become far better at. And we've made missed turns along that road. Um, but each of those little impacts is like why we've seen such uh, positive growth and improvements in the way that people find us looking for some topics like how to build remote company culture. Yeah. Awesome. What's one of the best books you've read? So my favorite startup book would definitely be um, the, the, the co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz, Ben Horowitz's mm -hmm. book. Uh, I'm actually failing to remember the the title. Oh yes, it's the hard things about hard things is the mm -hmm. the title of the book, and it is a story of him and his startup. And to summarize it pretty easily, he just always had the wrong timing with his then startup before mm -hmm. founding Andreessen Horowitz. So if you know anything about Mark and um, and Ben, is it things kind of went like perfectly for Mark. He invented JavaScript, or he helped with the invention of JavaScript. He had Netscape, and like he was very early on uh, at the height of the '90s dot com boom. And Ben had worked with him. He was actually his, uh, you know, he was older, uh, but worked underneath Mark. Um, and Ben had started his company just before the dot com crash imploded. And the book is basically about every six months, um, he was just getting like kicked in the gut uh, in his business in one way or another. And it's a story of how he kind of persevered through that. And that really like shone a light on how he thinks about investing today. Cool. All right. So book to add to our list. <laughs> awesome. Where can we connect with you? 
Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, people are also welcome to email me, um, you know, Kumo, uh, Drew at kumospace.com. Uh, also, we do all of our demos. Um, if you want to talk to a human when you're evaluating the product, they're all done in our virtual office. So when you come in, depending on the time of day, there's probably 20, 30 people hanging out, working in there, um, including myself. So awesome. if you ever do uh, do a demo and you talk to one of the uh, support or salespeople on the team, they'll probably be able to find me in a few minutes. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Drew. Thank you.